Well, hi, I'm Noah Bradley with Handmade House TV, and on today's episode, we're gonna talk about getting those heavy logs from the ground up onto our log home, how best to handle that. Stay tuned. Well, all right, so how is it best that we handle the job of getting the logs from the ground up onto our log home? How do we best handle lifting something extremely heavy and safely getting it into place? It's a question I get all the time and people want to know how is it that I handle this aspect as a log builder. Uh, there are generally four different options, four different pieces of equipment that uh, the average owner builder can use when doing this. One is forks on the front of, uh, of a tractor or a backhoe where it, it picks the log up and can maneuver it around the site and set it into place. Uh, the second one would be a, a boom, basically, and uh, it's just a triangular piece of uh, steel or wood that is mounted on the front uh, or back of a tractor or a pickup truck. On the end of it is a block and tackle, and it's either hooked to, uh, generally hooked to a, a winch, an electric winch on the vehicle, and that will uh, raise or lower the logs. Uh, another option would be a gin pole. Uh, it can be a, either be a single pole that's anchored in the ground with guy wires going off to the sides. And again, it would have a block and tackle up on the top and could it be either operated with a rope with people pulling on it to pull the log up into place, or again with a cable uh, that would hook to a, a fixed winch elsewhere. And then the final uh, solution would be uh, some, kind of, uh, some kind of crane uh, that could lift the logs and set them into place. It seems that when we seek out reference books on how to build a log cabin that a large percentage of those books is focused on these devices on how best to raise our logs. And uh, it, often it often turns into a stumbling block, a stoppage, a blockage for people to move forward because they can't decide which of these they should, they should purchase, which of them they should use. Uh, the reason why there's so much attention given to it by the authors of these books is A, generally people that are in the log cabin industry are of an engineering uh, self-sufficiency mentality. That that's, they, they love devices, they love machinery, they love how things work, and so they, they love to tinker with things, they love to possess such devices. Uh, the second reason that they devote so much time to it is that very likely uh, setting log cabins is what they do for a living. Uh, it's one after another, uh, uh, primarily setting the logs uh, and then moving on to the next project and setting the logs. They do this over and over again, so they need a system going forward. And generally, they tend to be extremely aware of their equipment. Uh, they buy the best. Uh, they know how to use it. Uh, and uh, they keep it they keep it well maintained and uh, they are aware of the safety issues with regard to it uh, but as far as uh, individuals like you that will build a one log cabin in their life or maybe two uh, that that you have a lot of those uh, conditions working against you uh, and again I build log cabins for a living but I build log homes I build them from the a raw piece of land uh, to absolute completion. I only will erect uh, one to three log cabins a year. It typically takes two weeks to set the logs into place. It typically takes up to a year to convert those logs into a finished home. Uh, so I don't do enough of it in order to, that I feel comfortable in properly maintaining and operating it and making sure I have someone skilled on site that knows how to use it. The problem with uh, equipment, the problem with heavy lifting equipment is, uh, is multi-fold and that is that first of all we tend not to buy the best when we're only going to use it one time. If we want a tractor with forks on it, chances are we're not going to go to a dealership and buy a brand new tractor. We're going to buy something used. Uh, if we're building a gen pole, likely it's the first time we've ever built such a device. If we create a, a, a boom off of the front of the truck, uh, we're trusting the welding joints of each one. We're trusting the chain. We're trusting the winch. There's just so many things that can go wrong. And then you couple in the fact that, uh, that whoever's operating this machine, first of all, 
uh, what is their degree of expertise and experience with using this device. If they've used it over and over again, that's one thing, but if they haven't, that's quite another. And another issue is that uh, whoever's operating this machine is not doing anything else. Uh, if we are working on a log home, we're going to have to count on having an operator. And it would be better to have an experienced operator than one that is not. And chances are you as the log builder will be the one with the most amount of experience on the project. And your expertise is more needed on the log end than on the lift end. And of course there's the issue of the expense of having such equipment uh, in, to purchase it, to store it, to maintain it, to insure it. Also there's the aspect of is it available when we need it. I've worked on projects again back in that mid 1980s where suddenly we needed to lift a log and it was an, a man had to go get the tractor, he had to jump start it, and generally by the time he got back the crew went ahead and decided to hand lift the log onto the project themselves. Perhaps the greatest danger that comes from the use of any of these devices is the overconfidence that I've seen so many develop within a matter of minutes on a job site that can lead to a serious injury. Uh, if you're not aware, more people will get injured on, uh, in the log home industry from the logs than they ever will from a chainsaw. Logs are dangerous things. And by the way, I thought I might show you this. Uh, one more benefit of working with uh, hewn logs, with you working with logs in the traditional manner where the inside and outside faces are flat. I did this little experiment on, the, on my backyard uh, that is uh, sloped, and I took uh, two logs, one that was hewn and one that was round, and I laid them side by side and I, would, I gave the little round one a nudge and uh, it just went uh, rolling on down the hill, never once stopping. Whereas the hewn log, no matter how many times I gave it a kick, that, uh, that I, couldn't get it to, I couldn't get the momentum going, it would just stop. And I can say that in working with the hewn logs on building a log home, there's a lot less opportunity to a log getting away from you and hurting you or another individual on the site and if nothing else, it will prevent many a pinched finger from the log just suddenly, unexpectedly rolling a few inches towards you. Yet again, another benefit of working with traditional log homes. So how is it that I lift the logs on the log cabins that I build, and how would I recommend you as a first-time log cabin builder set your logs? The uh, answer to that is that we take, first of all, we take it one step at a time, one log at a time. That first log down on the ground is not that hard to get up onto our foundation. We can roll it, we can slide it, we can lever it, or we can lift it. Now I choose to lift a log as little as possible, uh, but I have set entire log cabins by myself up to 16 feet by 18 feet simply by grabbing one end of the log at a time and raising it a few inches and putting a block underneath it and then going to the other end, lifting it again back and forth. But I do my best to always slide a log, roll a log, lever it, uh, do whatever I can to coerce it into place. Recently in the Log Cabin Academy, I built a small log cabin. It only measured uh, six feet by nine feet and uh, basically uh, I set all the logs into that other than two and I had friends stop by to offer or give me a hand just to, uh, to help out and uh, I wasn't crazy enough to turn that down. But nonetheless, even nine foot logs, I bet some of them weighed as much as 300 pounds uh, wet. Uh, I'm, I'm 60 years old, I'm out of shape. Uh, I could not lift a 300 pound log if I had to but still I was able to get 300 pound logs eight feet up in the air uh, by myself through just manipulating it one little bit at a time. Uh, the second thing that I could encourage you is that uh, once you have that first log set into place on your foundation, well the next log is only 12 inches higher up in the air than that. Certainly if you can get the first log at that point, you can figure some way to get the next log up another 12 inches. And that's pretty much the process of building an entire log cabin as we go up. Now I do encourage folks to build log cabins small. 
uh, and that is if you want a large log home, you can add two or three log cabin units together to create a very attractive log home. I think smaller log cabins are more attractive. They're a lot more manageable to build, and they allow us to build a log cabin one section at a time. If we keep our log cabin small, the logs are obviously much easier to lift into place. And then there's the aspect of when we are building a log cabin that typically the first six to eight courses of logs that we set into place tend to be short pieces of logs. They are the logs that run between the corners and the windows and the windows and the doors and the doors and the doors and, the, and uh, between the uh, corner and the fireplace. So it never fails that once we start that we can get that first course of logs up easy. The next, uh, next few courses are just short pieces that we can manipulate. And finally, we have what I refer to as spanner logs, those logs that go across the tops of our windows and our doors. Uh, these tend to be long logs, and this is our first experience. This is our first trial in trying to figure out how to get the logs uh, up in the air at such a height. If we are working with a crew of, say, four guys, uh, they can easily lift the log up to 20 to 24 feet long and set it into place. I find that manually lifting a log into place, the use of human muscles, uh, that we are looking out for each other, that there is obviously a great deal of respect in the weight of the log, uh, we can work from uh, lifting one log end at a time, or, or we can have two men on each end of the log lifting it. I find the practice to be not only bonding between the individuals working on the site, a great sense of satisfaction in lifting heavy logs, uh, but also I believe that it's a lot safer. Uh, in 30 years of running my own company, never once has a log injured an individual on my crew. There are many log home companies that, that use re make regular use of the devices that we mentioned early in this video uh, that cannot claim the same. Now, if you are working as, an, as a solo log cabin builder and in the woods, uh, you have reached this point where you need to put some spanner logs up. Uh, the biggest piece of advice I can perhaps offer you is to ask for some help. This is a great opportunity to get to know your neighbors to ask them for help to, to, or to bring in some friends of yours to bring it in. It's a great opportunity to, to create a bonding memory with these individuals in our lives. I have friends of mine that, uh, or, and neighbors that uh, will come to me 10, 20 years later and uh, they will still bring up, remember that day that you asked me to come over and help set that log? Uh, I, I remember that and I'm so thankful that you came and did that. And sometimes we'll actually inspire our friends and neighbors to build a log home for themselves when they actually participate in the hands-on setting of the logs. Now there often does come a t point in building our log home where a boom truck would be safer and more efficient to have, particularly if we're building a large log home or if we're two stories up into the air. Uh, at this time, it's a, it's a wise choice to just hire a professional boom operator to come in. People that are highly skilled, people that use booms for a living, people that own uh, top high-end equipment that's well maintained. In just a matter of a few hours, or at worst, a couple of days, uh, they can uh, speed us through and get the top of our log home finished to lift these heaviest logs that we have. And uh, I find it much more cost effective to pay a professional boom operator for two days of his time than for me to maintain equipment for years. So to summarize everything, please don't let the lack of a, of a log lifting implement in your life stop you from building your log cabin. Don't let this be an obstacle that you can't figure a way around and it brings you to a halt. Go ahead, keep moving forward on your log home. Get your logs onto the site. Set that first log into place. See how far you can carry it along. And then consider asking for help, either from neighbors or friends. And if you feel that you need a, uh, some kind of device in order to lift that log, then hire a professional with, with, uh, with the best, the top quality, highly maintained equipment to give you a hand on those just couple of days that you need help. 
Well, all right, that about wraps it up with this week's episode of Handmade House TV. Thank you so much for tuning in and for those kind comments that you leave. I'd like to thank five new members of the Handmade House Guild and Academy course. Uh, Steve Crawford, Denny Gardner, Connie Raitt, Scott Kenny, and Jamie Reed. Thank you guys so much for enrolling and for your wonderful feedback on the, all the benefits that come be, with being Guild members. And if you are not a member of the Handmade House Guild, we invite you to join us. Just come visit us over on handmadehouses.com to learn more. So until next week, you take care. We'll see you then. <laughs>